Got a backpack here with some seemingly unrelated items contained within. I've got a pair of sunglasses, got a baseball, a Rubik's Cube, the number 42, the letter K, and well, they must all serve some sort of purpose together. I mean, heck, they all came out of a set. So, we are going to start our discussion with discrete mathematics talking about something called sets. I had a set of things in that backpack, right? Seemingly disassociated, but they were very unique, distinct items that were contained inside of that backpack. Now, what does set theory have to do with anything when it comes to the computer? Well, let's take a look at this little fake configuration screen that I made up. We have a couple of these binary Boolean on-off options. We got show toolbar, lock toolbar, okay? Um, then I've also got this one, that, this drop-down box, this thing that allows you to select font size from something like very small to small to medium to large to very large, okay? So you have five distinct items in that set. All right. Then we've got the bottom one, which doesn't really look like a set, but it turns out it is. I mean, think about it. When we are setting up a default zoom, we're not going to be using real numbers to define the zoom. We're not, you know, as opposed to fake numbers, right? No. When I talk about real numbers, I'm talking about the continuous number line, right? So you've got this continuous, you know, between any two points on a real number scale, you've got an infinite resolution between those. And so one number has it has basically, when you're talking about its accuracy, an infinite number of digits to the left of the, to, excuse me, to the right of the decimal point, right? This is going to be an integer, but not only is it going to be an integer, it's going to have a specific range. You're not going to go negative, right? The zoom is not going to go negative. Heck, you're probably not even going to go to zero. One percent is unlikely, but what we're looking at here is more than likely just positive integers, maybe less than 800, let's say, okay? Uh, allowing you to have any level of zoom. So those are all, each one of those items in this configurations or settings window is the, the, the values that they can take on are part of a set. I forgot to really talk about those two binary ones at the top. It's either the, the set that we are picking from is yes or no, or on or off, or true or false, or one or zero, right? So, but there, but that's it's got a limited set that it's picking from. So let's talk about the lingo when it comes to discussing set theory. First of all, the items, the the items in my set here. So you know the baseball, right? Each item is meant to, is is referred to as an element or a member. So this baseball or this this baseball is an element or a member of the set. Now, the set, which is defined by this backpack, right, is said to contain its elements. Now, the elements, like I said before, are very distinct. There's no kind of vagueness between these. They're, they're very separate items. But also, the membership is what we would call binary. And it, either it is a member of the set or there's not a member of the set. You don't see a toothbrush in here. There's no toothbrush as a member, but the baseball is a member. The other thing is, is that if you look at the items that are in this backpack, um, there's no set order. I mean, I could have pulled out the skeleton, that little Halloween, the Halloween display thing first, uh, but I didn't, you know, it just ended up being the last. And, and you may think that there's an order. For example, let's say we're talking about a set that contains the vowels out of the, uh, out of the, the alphabet, okay? So we have A, E, I, O, U. You think, because you've heard it over and over again, that there would be an order to them, but there's no order to them. There's not actually a sorted order inside of a set. You think about the positive integers. Yes, there, uh, there is an order. They are sortable. But inside of a set, they're not considered to be ordered. So the set, and in fact, let's go ahead and write a set here. And by the way, one of the things that we do when we're talking about a set is I can list the elements inside of these curly braces. So I could have this set one, two, three, 
which is actually the same thing as 2, 1, 3. Those two sets are exactly the same. They contain the elements. There is no, no order to it. Um, something that's really kind of funny is that a set could actually be a member of a set. So I've got this backpack here, right? I'm going to try and zip up to keep all of the items inside of it. So I've got this tray of other backpacks. So I've got one, two backpacks. I put it in here. Each one of these backpacks, they contain something else or maybe empty. Maybe some of them don't contain anything. But I've got now a set that contains three sets could actually be that it contains three sets, but then again, it also contains an item. So there, we can mix things up whenever it comes to creating sets. So for example, if I have uh, this set right here, maybe I have another set, uh, 99, two, and then inside of it, I have this two, one, three, and so I've got items mixed in with a set, all right? Now, one of the things that I have talked about already is this idea of curly braces or curly brackets defining or encapsulating the items inside of a set. We can also use additional notation. So for example, let's say that I am defining a set that is meant to show all positive even numbers. So we've got two, four, six, eight. Do you want to write all of them? No. So you can use the ellipsis in order to say, just keep going. You saw the pattern, right? Let's keep it up. Now, we also have other methods of representing or, or discussing these sets. Now, typically, we have a, a capital letter, you know, just, let's just say D representing, so we can use this capital letter to say the set D is defined by that, uh, by, you know, what's inside the curly braces. Uh, you know, maybe E would represent the positive even numbers. Now, whenever you're talking about a specific generic element inside of here, typically we refer to it with a lowercase letter. So let's say that I've got some sort of an element E. Now, E, I, I haven't defined what E is. Maybe E is equal to 2, all right? If E is equal to 2, we can say, when we're writing things out generically, that E is an element of capital E. There's a lot of E-looking things there, aren't there? All right? Uh, you know, you could just simply say X is an element of capital X. This is a way of defining or saying that, you know, if we're going to go through and kind of write a, a, a have a practical way of displaying what we're trying to describe in this set theory, I just simply use this symbol here in order to identify that X is an element, this lowercase x is an element of uppercase x. Now, it is also possible, for example, let's say that I've got uh, B, and B is equal to an odd number. Well, B is not an element of capital E. So there's two symbols right here. Actually, we've got four symbols that we've talked about. Curly brackets, identifying a set, allowing us to define a set. The ellipse saying, yeah, just continue this series on. The is a member of symbol and is not, or excuse me, is a member of or is an element of symbol and is the not a member or is not an element of. Now, in this set here, I didn't take everything out of this set that was in here. So I showed you the baseball, right? I didn't show you the other baseball, all right? There are actually two baseballs in here. Now, does that mean that Baseball A and Baseball B, both baseballs are a member of the set? No, what you're saying in this case, and this may be a little hard to understand whenever it comes to maybe my example here in, all the great, in the greatest, but baseball is a member of the set, not baseball and baseball. Let's do that with numbers. If I've got a set S and it's equal to one, two, two, three, three, this is actually the same thing as one, two, three. 
All right, there's three elements in there. So just because an element is repeated in a set does not mean that there are more than that element. So for example, this guy right here, how many elements does that set have? Turns out it just has three elements. Because remember, one of the definitions we were talking about before is that the items or the elements inside of a set, the elements contained in a set, the elements that are a member of the set, those are distinct. Those two are not distinct those two are not distinct. Now there are some special sets, some sets that you're used to using if you've spent any time inside of a classroom of mathematics. For example, we've got the set of natural numbers. Well, the set of natural numbers are just zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 right? All right, so, you, so it's all non-negative numbers. So whenever I talk about nat the natural number sequence, I start at zero. So it's the non-negative, the no negatives in there, but everything else. You also have the set of integers. So the set of integers would be something like dot, 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 negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 okay? So you've got the full set of integers. But sometimes we don't want natural integers because maybe we don't want zero. We want just positive integers. So we also have a common set referred to as the positive integers. Sometimes that is shown with the capital Z defining the set with a little superscripted plus right next to it. And so this is just one, two, three, four, dot, 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 and so on, all right? We also talked about another set earlier on, the binary set, which is just zero and one. Those are the only two elements that are inside of the binary set. Now, it turns out that there is another special set that I don't have listed up here, but it is a set that is going to be important whenever it comes to our discussion of the theory of sets. And that guy is described with this little zero with the, the line through it. Uh, I think it's a phi. And that is, it is a set actually, but is referred to as the empty set. So it is a set, it just doesn't contain anything. Now, whenever we said uh, that, um, you know, I have a set S, whenever we said that a set could contain a set, turns out that a set could contain the empty set. Now hold on to your hats. This empty set is a set that doesn't contain anything. This set right here, however, contains something. It contains a set. Now, granted the set that it contains is an empty set, but that set S is not the empty set because it actually contains something. All right. Now, Sometimes representing these sets can get a little complicated. Now, whenever we do start getting deep into programming, one of the things we're going to learn is that um, it, when we go and pass through a sequence of steps or a sequence of numbers, sometimes we refer to them as loops and so forth, we're going to go through those loops and it's possible that those loops will just simply count 0, 1, 2, 3, just normal. But sometimes it may be a very interesting formula that defines what the next step is, what the next element is, what the next number we're operating on is. So we have to become accustomed to defining or representing sets um, using a set of rules or requirements. Now, the rules or requirements are used, uh, are, are defined, are going to be written down formally using something called set builder notation. Now, set builder notation still uses the curly braces. So what we've got is a set capital X is equal to, and so we still have the curly braces. But what we're going to do is we're going to just simply say some generic element, lowercase x, and then put this vertical pipe here. Now that vertical pipe translates to the words such that. So, so we're looking at all x, the members of the members represented by this lowercase x such that, and then we'll put x satisfies, one, uh, we'll just put one or more requirements. All right, and there we go. 
we've got this set builder notation. Now I realize that that may, I don't know, may not, may be a little vague. So let's go ahead and define a set. Let's define a set S. And we'll just simply say X such that X is contained in the positive integers and X is less than, we'll just say, I don't know, how about a uh, hundred? From this notation, we should get an idea of what the set S looks like. Specifically, it's got to be a positive integer, right? And it's got to be less than 100. So you're looking at uh, one, up to, uh, 1 up to 99. All right, there you go. Now, some people, instead of using the vertical pipe, use a colon there. But we're going to use the vertical pipe in this in this. Uh, in this uh, class. Now, another way, since this right here, this is really specifying what we'll refer to as the universe from which the requirements are being applied. So another way of writing this would be S is equal to the set X in the universe of the positive integers such that X is less than 100. All right. So that'll give you an idea of how to quickly write down some of these sets or without having to, you know, by, by getting them, by formulizing them, by giving them a way of being computed rather than writing out the sequence and hoping that somebody understands, I don't see how this pattern is going. The ellipses, sure, that means the pattern keeps going, but I don't quite understand exactly how to calculate the next one. So using this set builder notation, let's go ahead and define a couple of other types of special sets. We talked about, you know, the positive integers, natural numbers, and so forth. Q. <clears throat> Q is typically representative of the rational numbers. Now, what a rational number is, is a ratio of an integer to an integer as long as the integer that's on the bottom is not equal to zero. So the way you write this would be something along the lines of Q is equal to P divided by little q, such that P is an element of Z, any integer, right? Q is an element of Z, any integer, and Q is not, whoops, didn't want to put an element symbol there, Q is not equal to zero. So I've got three requirements there. So it's looking at, for example, five divided by two would be, you know, 2.5, but five divided by two satisfies all three of those requirements. Now, there are some irrational numbers. For example, pi is an irrational number. There is no ratio which exactly, precisely represents pi. The natural, you know, the natural log, the E, that E, two point, what is it, 2.7, something, 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 something. Um, that is an irrational number that you're not going to find in this set. All right. Now, there is a set that encompasses all of the, of the real numbers. Well, it's R. That's our real numbers. So it's X such that X is a real number. And of course, this is not a class on complex arithmetic, so we're probably not going to get a chance to talk too much about complex numbers, but there are other sets that go beyond this. Because this is a class on discrete, or because these lessons apply to discrete math, we're going to talk mostly about numbers that are, are discrete. You can create a set and pretty much enumerate all of them out. Now, we've got a few last properties, these set properties that we're going to talk about. First of all, cardinality. Cardinality is the number of distinct, and once again, here we come up with this distinct, two baseballs is still one element, distinct members of S. Now it's represented with what looks like the absolute symbol symbols, and there's actually a relationship here. But so the apps, so you put those, the, you put the bars around it. What you're asking for is the cardinality of S. So let's assume that S is equal to one, two, three. 
all right? The cardinality of S is equal to three. There are three elements in there. And the same would be true if S was equal to one, two, three, three, two, one, right? All right, we're still talking about the, the number, the total number of elements that are in there, distinct elements that are in there, all right? Now, we also have this idea of a finite versus an infinite set. All right. Whenever we talked about a finite set, this is a finite set. There are three elements, all right? And the cardinality is what we're going to look at when we're trying to define the difference between a finite and an infinite set. A finite set is one where you can figure out what the cardinality is, and it's not equal to infinity. So the natural numbers, that's, not, that's, a, that's an infinite set because it keeps going, right? The positive integers, the negative integers, the whole set of integers, real you know, uh, rash, irrational numbers, rash, or excuse me, rational numbers, those are all infinite sets. But the items that are in this backpack, that is countable, and it is a finite set, something that we can determine the cardinality for. A couple of other set properties we might want to talk about. First of all, there is the concept of equality in a set. So A and B are equal if, and it's written just like you'd expect it to be, A equal sign B. And they're equal if every single element that's in A is in B, and every single element that is in B is in A. So the way we write this is that A equals B if, and I don't know if you've seen in any of your math courses this upside down capital A, but that represents the saying, it translates to for all, all right? So if for all x, x is an element of A and x is an element of B, all right? And so this, this idea that and, and this is really all you need to, to do in order to prove this, is to just show that everything that's in A is in B and everything that's in B is in A. Remember, uh, it's, these are distinct elements, all right? One more thing, we've got this idea of something called a subset, all right? What is a subset? Well, if you think about a subset, what it means is that everything in one set is contained inside of another set. So it's similar to this, except we don't have to have it go backwards. For example, A would be a subset of B if for all the elements X in A, they are contained in B, but not, very, but not vice versa. So let's say if for all X, A, and this in the, in, in the literature, this me this arrow going both directions basically means it goes both ways. In other words, every element in X is implies that it is contained in B, and every element in B implies that it is contained in A. All right. So what we've got is a definition here. A is a subset of B if every element in A is also an element of B, all right? Now, notation for that is pretty simple. Uh, it's, a, it's this little C looking thing with an underline. So A is a subset of B. That's the symbol that says that A is a subset of B. Now this line underneath if you're familiar with the idea of, for example, in math, I've got uh, A is less than or equal to B. This is really kind of the same, same uh, method. What you're saying is A is a subset of B, and it could also be equal, all right? If you don't want A to be equal, but you want everything else, in other words, it's kind of like equivalent to A is less than B, if every element in A is contained in B, but B has a larger cardinality, in other words, it has elements that are not contained in A, then you would write it this way, all right? Without the bottom line, without that lower equal sign, right? So 
A is a subset of B, or it is equal to B, and this one is A is a subset of B, but it is not equal to B. And by the way, you also have the not a subset, so you can also write this this way. So A is not a subset of B, and similarly, looks like a cent. There you go. All right. Now, uh, for example, we might have something like uh, 1, 2, the set containing 1, 2 is a subset of 1, 2, 3. So I give you an idea of how we're getting started with this set theory. When we move on to the, you know, whenever we've got a good grip on this, we're going to move on to this idea of combining sets in order to create new sets. But we got to start with how to represent that. We're going to do that using something called Venn diagrams.